Okay, let me uh, at least let, you, let me get started anyway, and if they have to make adjustments, they'll make adjustments. The title of this is Parallel Streams, Completable Futures, and all that. The idea is to look at the concurrence mechanisms and parallel mechanisms inside of Java. Now, I specifically was referring to Java 8. Of course, everything carries over right to Java 9. They've added a few methods to the API in Java 9, but basically it's the same exact stuff. So anything I'm going to talk about now is uh, applicable to both 8 and 9. In fact, I have run this code. The code I'm going to show you is, um, works under both Java 8 and Java 9, and I'll give you the information for that. Now, uh, my name is Ken Cousin, by the way. It's Cousin like the relative, even though it doesn't look like it. I think it's Ellis Island job or something. Uh, my, my company's Cousin IT. Uh, I call it Cousin IT. My wife refers to it as Cousin It, like the Adams family. It was her idea. What can you do? Uh, at any rate, there's my email address, website, blog, and Twitter handle. Feel free to contact me whenever. My delete key works as well as anybody's, right? You know, but I'm, but sh yeah. At any rate, uh, a few years ago, I wrote a book called Making Java Groovy. That's a Java Groovy integration book published through Manning. Last year, I wrote a book called Gradle Recipes for Android. Uh, just to undercut sales entirely, if you were to go to gradle.org and register, you can get that book for free if you want. So it uh, shows my negotiating capabilities. I negotiated a royalty on a book that I knew they were going to give away. So you don't want me negotiating your next contract. This is the book that I have out now, uh, Modern Java Recipes, and everything I'm going to talk to you about, pretty much, is in this book. We are actually having a book signing at O'Reilly in the exhibitor. I think they're uh, one, one floor down over by the wall tomorrow at, afternoon at 2 o'clock, if you're interested. Now, the reason I bring it up is partly because my editor would be really annoyed if I didn't, but also because these are the URLs for the GitHub repositories for the code I'm going to show you. The entire book repository is under github.com slash my last name, and then the name is java underscore eight underscore recipes. Now I have several small examples I'm going to show you out of there, but then I needed a larger example to show how the completable future stuff is put together. I threw in a parallel stream as well. That one is under a separate repo called CF box scores. I'm going to download box score data from Major League Baseball uh, online. So I'm, I'm probably asking a lot out of our Wi-Fi, but hey, you know, if you don't, you don't try, you know, let's see what happens, right? If it was easy, anybody could do it. Uh, so at any rate, I have two GitHub repos involved, and you're welcome to take anything you like out of there. For the book, I also have a repo called Java underscore nine underscore recipes for the handful of Java nine ones as well, but I'm not using that for this talk. Uh, if you have a Safari account, I have a whole bunch of video courses at Safari Books Online. I also teach training classes there, and of course all the books are available there as well. But that's more self-marketing than I could stomach, so let's move on. Now, yeah, let's get this out of the way, because anytime you talk about concurrency and parallelism, somebody gets annoyed and they get very precise about it. Uh, I'm defining it this way. This is how I understand it. Concurrency is something you design for. You're talking about having multiple things that can run at the same time, that can go concurrently, as they say, but that doesn't mean they are running concurrently. It just means we try to design them with that in mind, whereas parallelism is when we actually are running two things at the same time. So in principle, you have to have multiple cores to do parallelism, although I would argue if you do multiple threads, it's effectively parallel as well, but that's the gray area. That's where a lot of debates will happen. I'm going to try to use those words with that in mind. Those are the definitions you tend to see online, so I thought I'd bring them here. So, all right, there's the definitions. Now, I want to bring up something that you may be aware of. Uh, Rich Hickey, the creator of the Clojure programming language, Clojure with a J, basically Lisp on the JVM, gave a keynote presentation several years ago at a conference called Strange Loop. Some of you may know it in St. Louis. Uh, it's called Simple Made Easy. Now, it's a fascinating keynote, but it's useful from my point of view for one reason. The concept was is some things are inherently simple, meaning conceptually simple and even simple in execution. You know exactly what to do step by step. Whereas the concept of easy is that, hey, it's a method call in a library, and there could be a ton of complexity under the hood, but it was easy to do. 
with the parallel streams in Java 8, they have made it very easy to experiment with parallelism, but that doesn't mean that getting excellent performance out of concurrent parallel applications is simple. See, it's, it can be very complex, and I'll talk about what the general, generally accepted requirements are for this to be beneficial, for this to work out. But I don't want to pretend that even though they've added a lot of classes to make it easy to experiment, it's still not a simple phenomenon going to parallel stuff here. I want to combine that notion, uh, by the way, I, one of my favorite uh, demonstrations or illustrations of the word uh, easy is that I remember there was a script presented for Star Trek The Next Generation, uh, having an anniversary this year, and they, the uh, writer had written out this elaborate set of instructions for Captain Picard to tell him how to go into orbit around a planet, and he crossed it all out and went standard orbit, and, and, and that was it. So that's easy without necessarily being simple, and that's the kind of idea I'm looking for. Now, I also want to mention a comment from Brian Getz. I'm sure you're familiar with Brian Getz. If he's in this room, please don't tell me. I'll be far too intimidated to complete this talk, okay? Uh, Brian Getz is the author of Java Concurrency in Practice. He also uh, has, uh, was one of the chief architects for Java at Sun and now Oracle, you know, one of the real giants in the, in the industry. When he talks about concurrency, actually when he talks about anything, I listen. I don't generally understand, but I, I do listen. Um, he has said many times that parallelism is strictly an optimization. This is coming most recently out of one of a series of articles he wrote on Java Streams at DeveloperWorks, the IBM site, DeveloperWorks. I put in a link there to uh, Article 4 out of a series of 5. That's the one where he talks about parallel streams. You're welcome to all of this. Of course, the presentation's been uploaded, but if you need it before that, just contact me. I'll be happy to send it to you. Uh, at any rate, so the idea with all the parallelism and concurrency mechanisms in Java is to get your code working sequentially first. Work with a, a sequential stream, and then once that's working, then you can experiment with parallelism and have some confidence that you can draw some conclusions and get some benefits out of it. All right, that's all the waivers. Let's go on. These are all the factory methods, if you will, the mechanisms that we use in Java to create streams. There's the stream method that's a default method that's been added to collection. There is the of method, the factory method that's used in many classes in Java 8 to produce an object. There's the iterate method that takes a seed and then a unary operator and provides uh, successive values by applying the unary operator over and over again to the existing values. And then there's the generate method that takes a supplier. It just invokes the supplier over and over again and retrieving results as we go. All of those by default produce sequential streams. So whenever you, if you don't, let's put it this way, if you don't specifically say parallel, it's sequential. That's the idea. Now, there are a couple ways to make a parallel stream. One is, is that collection also has a parallel stream method so that we have that option as well. And oftentimes what I'll do is I'll create an app with a stream in it and then just change it to parallel stream to see if that improves anything or what I have to tweak in order to get benefit out of that. There's also a method called parallel in stream. Now, technically that's in base stream, the parent interface for stream. There's also a method called sequential as well. And the Java docs are very vague about it, but the idea is that Parallel will return a parallel stream or the existing stream if it's already parallel, and sequential will do the same for sequential ones. These are both intermediate operations on stream, meaning they produce a new stream from what we're dealing with, uh, and then it, it, we don't get any values until we put a terminal expression on there, as we do with stream processing normally. If you want to find out if a stream is sequential or parallel, then there's a method called is parallel that returns a Boolean, nice and simple, easy to find out whether you're dealing with a sequential one or a parallel one. But in general, unless it says parallel, it's sequential. Now, one of the things that is not obvious from the API, which is very important to know, is that you can't do part of a pipeline sequentially and then part in parallel. Now, we'll talk about which things you want to do sequentially and which things you want to do parallel in a minute, but the point is, is that you cannot just simply change from sequential to parallel and back and have that change in the middle of a pipeline. Now, if you know how stream processing works, this is not a surprise, but just as a quick illustration, I have a class in my 
repo called sequential to parallel test. And if I go to IntelliJ here, and I went to the, yes, this is the one I want. And I'm clearly going to have to make the font bigger, but let me open this first. So here is um, sequential to parallel test. And let me mo um, improve the font size because we changed everything here. So it'll only take me a moment. Uh, let me make it, um, I don't know, 35 or 36. How about that? Is that readable? Do you see that in the back? Uh, and great, it didn't do it, but hopefully it will. All right, I'll just do that, <laughs> and then I'll fix it later. Okay, so the idea here is I just have a, a series of test cases just to illustrate the mechanism. So here I say if I use the of method on a stream, I'm asserting that when I call dot is parallel, that will be false. Same thing on iterate, is parallel is false. Generate with math colon colon random, there's my supplier, specifically a double supplier. That also is not parallel. Here, if I created a list of elements and then call the stream method, again, that's not parallel. But of course, obviously, if I call parallel first, it will be, so I change that to true. And then down here, if I call parallel stream, of course it's true. So that's all well and good. That's not surprising. Where things get interesting is if you try to do parallel and then sequential consecutively, or even if you put values in between. Like here I'm saying, let's go to parallel because all I want to do is double the elements. And that's an independent associative operation that would be fine for parallel. I can even look at the values as they go by. And then I want to do sorting. And sorting I want to do sequentially because that's a stateful operation. And the, it already has its own parallel type of mechanism, concurrent mechanism built into it. I mean, it's not a true parallel sort, but it's just a, an existing sort. So this is the sort of thing you're tempted to do. Well, it turns out that parallel and sequential are basically setting or unsetting a flag. And since nothing happens till I hit the terminal expression here, the collect, what you would find is that once I hit the terminal expression, it'll say, well, we started parallel, we switched to sequential, the entire stream will be treated as a sequential stream, okay? So you can't turn it on for part and then turn it off. You basically have to do it as two separate streams. There's no easy way around that, okay? So also, if you're going to return a stream and then call something, you know, try to put them in separate methods, again, since nothing happens until you get the terminal expression, that's not going to help either. You might as well do the parallel part, return a, a collection with, of doubles, if you will, and then do the sequential part with the sort, and that's about the closest you can come to that. So I can, just for the sake of argument, I can execute this uh, entire class, and you see all the tests pass, and uh, therefore all those asserts about sequential and parallel are true, and not a big surprise. So again, that's something you need to be aware of, however. If you're not aware of that, that can bite you. Okay, now, when is parallel worth doing? Here are the basic requirements. First of all, I mentioned the operations have to be independent and associative. They do not have to be commutative because it's not going to try to switch the order A times B versus B times A. It's not going to do that. What parallelism is all about or concurrency is all about is grouping. So instead of processing 100 elements sequentially, we're going to divide them into groups of 25 and process them in individual groups. So it's all about the associative nature of the operation, not the commutative nature. So as long as the operation doesn't mind how you group them, that's a candidate for parallelism. Also, we want it to be stateless if we can. I'm saying that by saying independent so that the, each element doesn't depend on surrounding elements or any other element, like that doubling operation is clearly independent and clearly associative. So that's a minimum requirement to even bother with parallel. If you're doing something stateful or that has additional dependencies, it's not going to get you any benefit here. Now, another requirement is this thing you will see expressed on various websites as n times q greater than 10,000, where n is basically the number of data elements, and q is the amount of time spent processing each element. Now, the problem with that measurement, n times q greater than 10,000, is they never put a unit on q. So I don't, I mean, how do you measure? So let's just say it this way. The product of n times q must be above some threshold. You are introducing overhead by going to parallel. You are basically by default, as we're going to see, introducing a fork join pool, splitting up the work in individual sections, and then joining them back together again once they're done.
and that introduces overhead. And so therefore, you either need enough data to make that overhead worth it, or there needs to be enough time per element that that overhead is worth it. And things like multiplying or adding numbers together, believe it or not, is rarely worth it. The basic Java processor is incredibly fast at processing primitives. And I'll come back to that as an illustration. I mean, if I'm simply adding up numbers, I've done many test cases with, say, 10 million numbers, and that's nowhere near enough to make it worth it to go to parallel. Sequential is so fast on that, it's hardly worth going parallel. And I'll give you some better guides about that as we go. Now, another requirement that people don't talk about that often is that the data also needs to be easy to partition. Remember that when we go to parallel streams in Java, we are using this fork join pool under the hood. We are simply dividing up the work into equal size sections and doing the processing on each section and then merging them. Well, if the, if the machine can't figure out where the begin and where the end is, then it's not so easy to divide them up. So if you're doing, say, an int stream with a range, well, that's easy. It knows where the start is. It knows where the end is, range or range closed. But if you do a stream.iterate with a limit, that's asking too much. It doesn't necessarily know how. Now, of course, from a mechanical point of view, if you're dealing with an array as the source of your data, great, nice consecutive memory locations. That's a dream scenario for this. Whereas if you're dealing with a linked list, well, good luck. <laughs> Okay, so the idea is that the data should come from a situation that is easy to partition. If, and if you have that, then it's worth it. You can expect to get a significant gain out of parallel, uh, parallelization. Now, in order to show a demo, I'm going to show a simple demo that is going to just run a main method and illustrate this. But of course, all demonstrations like that should be viewed with some suspicion because you've got this hot start of the JVM, you don't know what else is going on in the system, etc. There is a project that comes from the OpenJDK project called the Java Micro Benchmark Harness. Many of you may have heard of it. It is a it is a Java project that is based on annotations, and it allows you to run a method as many times as you specify. It does a series of warm-up iterations. It'll create a forked JVM just to execute. You can do all kinds of, of optimizations in that, and this is an excellent way of of, uh, I don't want to say monitor, measuring basically the performance of individual methods on that. So I put in a link to the, uh, the JMH project. The project is not real well documented, but they do have lots of samples, and that's helpful. Now, I run it two different ways. One is that Gradle, I, I use a Gradle build tool for everything I do. Gradle has a nice JMH plugin, and that works fine. That's what I have in the repository if you were to take a look at the code base. Alternatively, IntelliJ IDEA also has a JMH plugin that lets you just run as and run as a method and it will do the benchmarking right there. So I do recommend this as a nice tool to give you data that you can actually have some faith in, you know, that might actually be something you could reproduce. Now, to show this, again, I want to mention when you do parallel streams, you are by default delegating to a fork join pool. Now, fork join pool was a class added in Java 1.7. It is an executor service. So if you're used to using executor service or executors.new cached uh, pool or, or fixed size pool or whatever, this is just another one. But this is the one they use by default. It does the, now, the common pool, which uh, is a, a method inside fork join pool, a static method called common pool, returns the common pool for the JVM. Now, this has mixed reputation because people go, well, if other things are going on in the system, I'm using the same pool and that's bad. Yeah, you could argue it, but it is a highly optimized pool that also does what they call work stealing, meaning that if, if extra jobs have been submitted and one thread happens to be idle, it'll go and grab the work. Okay, so it really does have excellent performance. I would say try it, and if it doesn't give you the performance you want, then all, most of the methods in completable future that I'm going to show allow you to specify an executor service or more properly a, a, a pool also if you want to. And I have an illustration of that as well. Now, when you make a fork join pool, technically the default pool size of that is equal to this calculation, runtime.getRuntime.AvailableProcessors. Um, 
Actually, I think I meant a plus one there rather than a minus one, and I'll fix that. But here's the thing. I, on my laptop here, which I suppose these days I should call a private cloud server, right? Yeah. It's just a laptop. At any rate, this laptop is about four years old. Uh, I'm waiting for, the, for them. I still want them to release a better Mac. I'm really hoping, you know. But at any rate, I have eight cores on this machine. So when I create this common pool and get the pool size, uh, this calculation of runtime.getruntime.availableprocessors returns uh, seven, but then you add one because the pool size may be seven, but main is still operating as well. So I just think of it as the work being distributed among all eight cores. And that's really how it, it does work in practice. Now, I'll show you in a bit how you could change the number of threads if you want. Okay, but first I'd like to demonstrate this. So I have a class called Parallel Demo. Let me go back here and I'll open that one up. Oop. So what I'm doing here is I have this method that's going to double a number. This is a function, obviously, and the reason I put it in a separate method is so I could manually introduce a sleep inside it. And I'm also going to do what I normally do whenever I'm trying to do anything with parallelization, which is I like to put in a print of the current thread's name so that I know which thread is operating to make sure I am using up all the threads and things are working. Now the main method here started off with a very small array list that has six elements. And what I'm going to do, uh, let me skip this, down here I'm going to make, uh, actually I'll make this in stream right here and I'll start off with it sequentially. Let me turn off the parallel part and I'll just map it to double it. So that's going to double each number, but it's going to uh, introduce the, the sleep as well. Now if I cut this down to only six elements right now, then I have enough cores for each core to get an element. Okay, so my n is very small, but I've got enough processors to handle them all individually. That's why I had to introduce a delay. Otherwise, I wouldn't see any change at all from going to parallel. So I'm going to double them all and then sum them. I actually don't care about the sum, but I need a terminal operation in order to make the stream actually work. And here I'm going to use instant.now and between. In other words, I'm just going to print out the amount of time this took. Okay, so now if I do this sequentially, I've got six numbers. I introduced a hundred millisecond delay. Well, by golly, that ought to take about six seconds. And if I look at the output here, it was a little over or six, 600 milliseconds. I introduced a 100 millisecond delay on each. So it took a little over 600 milliseconds, which is what I expect. And then if I turn, in, turn the parallel back on and run it again, you see, first of all, in the pools here, there are the workers one through five plus main. See, so I still count that and main will be reused. And this took just over 100 milliseconds. Now, this is the dream scenario for parallelization, okay? If, you're, if you live a good life and everything works out, this is what you'll get, you know? That's not going to happen very often, but it can be very beneficial. This is the one you show your manager, you know, in order to get him to let you go ahead and work on this, you know? So now, but the thing is, is I just did what I said not to do, right? I, I ran something in a main method just to demonstrate this was working. Well, with that in mind, I also have this doubling demo in a JMH package. And here you can see this is using annotations that come from JMH. I'm looking for the average times. I want the time unit to be milliseconds. Everything is scoped to a single thread, each calculation. I'm doing two fork JVMs. I tried to set the memory to be as big as I could afford so that memory was not an issue in this calculation. And then uh, there's my same double it, but this time I put in the two methods here, one with sequential, one with parallel, and I added the benchmark annotation on top of them. Now I could run it, but it would take a while to run now because it would do 20 warm-up iterations and then 20 actual iterations, which it would average, and it would do this twice for each of them. So I would have all of those runs, and with my delays, that would take a while. So instead, what I've done is I've copied the results and just put them here. So here is the sequential one, and what you could see is the average over the 40 was just over 600 milliseconds per operation, and with parallel, it was just over 100 milliseconds per operation, and those values, I believe. Okay, so it's a very nice tool, and it does give you confidence in, in the calculations that you're doing.
So that's really all you need to know to get started with the parallel stream stuff, and, and I wanted to give you that background. Now, one other thing that people always ask is how do you change the number of threads? Okay, there is, and this is listed in the Java docs themselves. If you go into the Java docs for fork join pool, there is a setting called, believe it or not, java.util.concurrent.forkjoinpool.common.parallelism. That mouthful. And you can set that in your, uh, on the command line with a dash capital D flag, or you can just do system.set property and pick another number. And I've actually done a calculation like that as well, this one called common pool size, just to show you what I mean. Uh, so here, this one, I just tried making a range from one to three million and sum them in parallel, and then I could print out the pool size, and then I could say, ooh, I could make a manual one, whatever size I want, and then I could use the regular old submit method, which is gonna return a, a fork join task, which means eventually I'll have to call get, and that throws all these exceptions. We'll get to that in a minute. But this is the base without changing the defaults. All I would have to do is change the system.get property and set this value, and I could run it in parallel as well. Now, if you change the size of the pool to much bigger than the number of processors on your disk, you're not likely to see a whole lot of improvement. Okay, again, the common pool is choosing processors based on, or the thread pool based on the number of processors you have. That's a pretty good guess, you know, but you do have the mechanism should you wish to do it. It is available and certainly worth experimenting with if you like. Okay, so enough with that one. Now, what was added in Java 8 was was completable future, but that's based on future. The future interface was added in Java 1.5. Okay, this has been in there since the addition of the java.util.concurrent package. And the thing about the future interface is that when you return a future using the submit method, takes a callable on an executor service, then the method returns immediately. And then you could go about doing other calculations. The problem with future, well, one issue with future is that in order to get the value out of the future, you have to call get, and get is a blocking call. So eventually you got to call get and hope that you're done or that you're ready to wait for it to be finished. Now that's okay, but that's the fact of life. Where life becomes difficult is that if I want to have multiple futures, if I want to say first do this, then do that, then do the other, now I got a problem. Because now I'm in what they call callback hell, or I've got some other way where I have to wait for everything to be finished, and now I feel like I'm back to blocking again. This is where completable future comes in. Completable future makes it very easy to coordinate multiple tasks so that it waits for one to be finished before the next executes and so on. So one way people have tried in the past to coordinate regular old futures is that the future has a method called is done and you could do this thing called busy waiting, put in a while loop that just keeps asking, are you done, are you done, are we there yet, are we there yet, are we there yet, and it's exactly that annoying, okay? And the problem is, is that that can generate literally billions of calls, you know, especially given how fast processors are right now. So while this works and I have a demo of it, I don't necessarily recommend it, okay? This is really a pain, and this, again, is partly why the, the completable future was created, and I'm going to jump to that now. So completable future is a class that's all about coordination. It implements two interfaces, future and completion stage, and that means there's a lot of methods involved, and I want to show you the basic idea. The first thing is, though, is how do you complete a completable future? If I don't want to call get, which, or, which I could, if I just want to complete it, there are three built-in ways. There's complete, which takes a value, completed future, or even complete exceptionally. Now, before I go to the code here, let me give you an idea how they're used together. So here's the idea. Say I have some cache, a map of integer to product. I use the concurrent hash map here. So a cache of integer to product, and now I have a method called get local, which is going to take the ID here and pull out the value from the cache. But I also have this legacy code 
that came from somewhere else. That has a get remote method, takes an ID, I'm introducing my simulation of a network delay, if you will, or the legacy delay. Then I also have the, the situation where it could throw an exception if something went wrong. I needed it to be predictable so I could, uh, uh, you like my choice of ID there, yes. Uh, <laughs> um, no, I'm not going to make any jokes. Moving on. So I wanted something predictable so I could write a test case for it. So I picked an ID. And down here, I'm ultimately going to return the value. Now, this is being done sequentially. Uh, actually, let's see how these are used. So if I have the get local and the get remote, and these are private methods, then the public method is called get product with an ID. Now, in normal Java code that was not concurrent, you'd write get, I get product with an ID, you'd return a product. In this case, I want to return a completable future of the product. So this will return immediately. So you try the local one. And when you call get on a map and, there's, and it's not in there, you get back a null. So I'll say, look, if it's not null, if it worked, then I use completed future and say, yep, there's my product. The future's done. We're ready to go. If it fails, if it's not in the cache, basically, now I have to use my legacy system. So I'll make a completable future here. I'll call get remote, returns a product, eventually put it in the cache, and this time I call complete on the already instantiated completable future and return that. Finally, if something goes horribly wrong in all of this, I catch an exception, make a completable future, and call complete exceptionally, which wraps the exception itself so that I can check the exception that comes out, and I can check its source and find out what happened with it, and all of that works as well. So that's why you have all three different methods. This is a nice illustration of that working. Given our time restrictions, I'm going to just say that, take my word for it that this works, and I'm going to go on to another example. Okay. Now, what about running asynchronously? Because all of that was synchronous, except for the fact that the product, the method returned right away. Okay? Well, completable future implements both future, that's why you have a get method and the others, join, etc. It also implements completion stage, which has about 38 methods in it. I went and counted, which means completable future has over 50, and it looks pretty overwhelming. Fortunately, there are patterns we could follow. The patterns look like this. The methods that have the word apply in them, like apply, um, apply uh, well, we'll see it. Apply, take as an argument a function, because uh, the mnemonic is, remember, if you looked at the function interface, inside is an apply method. Okay, so this connects a function, apply to function. Methods that have the word accept on them take a consumer. Again, inside the consumer interface, your single abstract method is accept. So it's trying to make it easier to remember that. The run methods take a runnable, that's easy. The supply methods take a supplier. So when you see these method names, you can just identify from those categories right away which of these they fit in. Now there's methods like then, and this is how you wind up chaining them together. So see, there's the apply, so apply takes a function. I'm going to take each element and I'm going to square it. Say, this example, by the way, is right out of the Java docs. I didn't even run this. This is right out of the Java docs. And then accept takes a consumer, at which point I'm going to print it. See, I just use a method reference, but so be it. And then run, and this takes a runnable, which is for who knows why, printing a carriage return. Okay, but that's the idea. By using these then methods, then each method will wait for the future to be done before going to the next one automatically. Now, they can run asynchronously, but it's sort of like joining on threads. One is waiting for the completion of the previous before it moves on each way. And by chaining together methods like this, you can accomplish much more complex tasks. So you saw then, there's also some patterns in the method names like either, which says either this one or that one, whichever finishes first. There's both waiting for both. There's combine, which says wait for this one and then provide a by function that's going to take the result of the first one and a completable future and put them together. So it's going to wind up allowing you to combine results. And again, I'll show you an example. So the other pattern that comes is that in many of the methods, they end with the word async, and then there's overloads that don't. The ones that don't operate in the same thread as the caller. So back here, none of these say async on them. This is delegating to a thread in the fork join pool, but all three of these methods are running in the same thread 
altogether. Whereas if I used then accept async or then run async, then it would take the job and resubmit it to the fork join pool to go for the next one. This can be very useful, but again, it introduces overhead, so it's something you kind of have to experiment with. It may not necessarily help, depending on all those other factors we talked about. But the key is to know which one is which, that the ones with async do operate in a separate thread, potentially, because it's resubmitting to the pool, and the ones without it don't. So let's look at some of this stuff. Again, uh, complete, oh, finally, there's one other category of methods in there. These are overloads. All the, pretty much all the methods that submit jobs take a, an extra argument of type executor, and that would say, if I don't want to use the common fork join pool, then I provide my own executor from the executor service. Okay, so if you want to just use the common fork join pool, you use the overload without that, otherwise you use it with it, and I have a whole set of test cases here on um, completable future tests, for example, that will show, for example, here, you can see I made a fixed thread pool and I did supply async. See, that's going to take a supplier, but it's going to submit separately to the pool, and I provided the third argument with, or the second argument with the pool itself, but then apply, then apply, then accept, that's all going to run in the same thread as the one I used in the pool. That's the sort of idea of what you can do. All right, now, if I go back to that get product one, the one that I showed before, I had everything in the remote lookup happening sequentially legacy system, it would be easy enough to replace that part with supply async. So I turn this into a supplier where I call get remote, put, and everything. That's all done as part of a completable future operating asynchronously. And when that's done, then the rest will happen. So that's a very simple change that could be made to hopefully improve the performance of this system in general. OK. now. We still have a get method. We still have a join method. It's interesting, this, some of the decisions made at the beginning of Java that we're still paying for, one of which is checked exceptions, right? We still have to deal with those. And if you write a lot of streaming code, you deal with that all the time. Well, the get method declares that it can throw both execution exception and interrupted exception, and those require, those are checked exceptions. They require a try-catch block or a throws clause or something. There's also a join method that does the same exact thing, and the only thing it throws is a completion exception, which is unchecked. So if you want to put in the try-catch block, you can put in get, and if you don't, you put in join, and it's basically the same thing. Now, of course, if you don't catch the exception, down you go, you know, fine. But if you want to manage it, you call get, otherwise you call join. But just like in future, those methods block to wait until things are done. On the other hand, this is another one that people don't tend to see very often, you can wait for the pool to become, quote, quiescent. There's a word for you. There is a method on fork join pool. So here I'm getting the common pool called await quiescence. And it takes a time unit and uh, a time, uh, an integer and then a time unit to say how long to wait for the pool to settle down and be no longer busy. And what you can do is that if See, here's the concept. I should say it this way. When you say supply async or any of those methods, you have started the process. You don't have to then, you don't have to do a start method or anything like that. It's automatically running. But the common fork join pool is composed of daemon threads so that if nothing is running, they all get terminated. See, if nothing else is operating, it just shuts down. So if you have a main method that just calls it, then it, the main method completes, then you get no results because all the daemon threads were terminated. You can either call get, at which point it'll block and wait for the thing to finish, or you could simply change the timeout on the common pool doing a wait quiescence and make it long enough that it will not finish before your calculation finishes. And either one of these work. The actual concept is that in a real system where you're submitting jobs all the time, the pool doesn't go quiescent. You don't have that problem. But this is one of those ones that until you see it, you may not even recognize it's there. And it's very useful in those simple cases where the pool would have gone away. And uh, you wonder, you're looking at somebody's code, and you're calling, why didn't they call get? Why didn't they call, what happened here? How did it complete? It completed anyway, just because they waited. Okay. 
One other thing I want to point out before I show you the bigger example. There are many methods in that completable future class. One of them is called all of. It takes a var arg list of completable futures of any kind. It's a static method. The problem with this method is it returns completable future of type void. Now that would be fine if I don't care about the results out of any of these guys. If I do care about the results, the question is how do I get them? The simplest thing to do is to make this completable future var arg list, make it a separate collection, and then transform it into an array so that you can call this, and then call join on the all of. So now you know they're all done. Then you can do stream processing to extract the results, and it looks basically like this. So here is all of demo here. So down, uh, let's look here. This, um, here's what I want to call is get value. I want it to return an integer, but I wrap it in a completable future. But again, if I'm going to do something with a sleep in it, which is how I'm going to make this take some time, that throws an exception. It's really awkward embedding exception handling code in a pipeline. So I made it in a separate method here to sleep for a random period about 100 milliseconds or less, return 42. I don't actually care about the value. And then here I'm going to call this a number of times. And here's my demo, is that I'm going to generate, calling that get value, a stream of 10 completable futures and convert them to an array. So this is normal stream processing code using some methods you may not use very often, like generate or to array, which is really convenient. There's my array. Uh, constructor reference, you know, kind of neat. That'll create an array. So now I've got an array of completable futures. I can use that in all of because an array matches the var arg argument and call join. And now they're done, and I can turn them back into a stream and map them using the join method, not to wait until they're finished, but to get the values out of them. So by calling map with the join, now I've turned my, transformed my stream of completable futures into a stream of whatever the values are coming out of the completable futures themselves. And then I could print them one by one. So in this case, I just, you get a bunch of 42s. And I do, you know. So this is a nice little mechanism that can be used to extract values out of the collection like that. Now, I have a bigger example. I'm mostly just going to have to show it to you. But this is the, the idea here is that Major League Baseball provides their box scores online for free. I think their own tools actually use these. And these box scores are updated continuously. Now, you don't need to know anything about baseball to understand this. You just need to know there are two teams, and they keep playing until there's a winner. And these, the, the statistics are compiled in something called a box score. That's all we need in this particular case. Oh, and that you don't know if a game's going to be played until it's actually played because it might get rained out. OK, that's enough. Now, here, for example, is that web page that I was mentioning, MLB here. And if I drill down into uh, the current year, so here's 2017, and then there's organized by month. I'll pick May 5th. It's my son's birthday, you know. And these are the games played that day. You could see them with a year, month, day, and then away team and home team. And the one or two would mean first or second game of double header. At any rate, these are the games that were actually played. And if you look inside one of these, you'll see there is a, a file look, here, right here called boxscore.json. And this is the one that has all the information in it. The who's playing, what the scores are, what the results are, everything. So this is a system that's been around for a long time. My, what I wanted to do in my application was access that site for a range of dates and then figure out the game links for each of those dates. Now to do that, to do the networking, I'm going to use OKHTTP, OK nice, very popular networking client. Download the JSON box scores for each game. And uh, I'm using the, um, the parser for HTTP. The, uh, uh, I forget the, the name of it right now, but it's a ve the very common HTTP parser. You'll see it when I see the code. I'm going to transform each JSON object into Java objects using JSON, use Google's JSON. So I wrote out the classes to map that. And then, see, now this is all stuff that I'd like to happen in one thread, except I'd like to have it concurrently for all the games or as many of the games as I could over the range. Once I have the data, however, I have several things I'd like to do essentially simultaneously. I would like to save the results to files. 
That's an I.O. one. That's going to be slower than everything else. I'd like to just determine the score of each game. I'd like to figure out which game had the highest total score, and I'd like to write them to the console with all the game scores with the max game and the max score. And all of this is in that other repo I was telling you about. So here's the basic idea. This is in that separate repository. Let me make this bigger. And I have this get games here. And the idea is, in my method print games, I make a completable future with a supply async to get the game links. So I wrote my own supplier, and this is something you don't see all the time, is you actually make a class that implements the supplier interface. I don't want to just use a lambda for this. I'm going to put in some state. There's the base location. There's my local date and the number of days. I'm going to do three days. By the way, Java 9 makes this easier because you can actually use local dates in a range now, whereas you couldn't in Java 8. Uh, here is my, um, actually, this is the calculation. Well, let me start down here at get. Get is going to iterate over the dates for that many days. And for each date, get the links on that page. And then if I get an empty list, I'll put in an empty stream. Otherwise, I'll put in a list of streams. And that's why I'm using flat map. And that will give me overall a list of, or a stream of game links. So I collect them into a list. And this is all using, oh, JSoup. That's the one I couldn't think of. So this is all using JSoup and OKHTTP to go find those links and then process them. OK, that's step one. Then the next thing um, is I want to retrieve the box scores. So sorry, that was here. So supply async and then apply this box score retriever. And this guy is going to, again, implement function and use Google's JSON with the client. So this down here, it's probably easier to see it here. In parallel, because why not, I'll map each of those links to the link to get the actual box score. Now, here's where the, the interesting part happens, or one interesting part. Uh, now, I know I'm a little over, but I'll finish it pretty quickly. The idea now is that I could get a rain out. And if, what, if that happens, there's no box score. And there's no way to know that. So I'm going to filter them by optional dot is present. In this game pattern to result mechanism, I'm returning an optional if there's a rain out. See, so if there's a rain out, then if the box score is not found, I'll return an empty. Otherwise, I do a nullable and I get them back and then call get and then turn them into the list here. And the others are simpler. The others, here I want to save the result list, which is simply a method up here to um, for each one, save the result to a file. And I'm writing out how to use JSON to do that. And then the, there's an exceptionally if something goes wrong. And here's the one to get the max score and get the future and all that stuff. And it's all in here. I join them all and then print them out. And if I execute this uh, here, let me run this execution here. And you'll see that they will all, if our Wi-Fi holds up, uh, pop out here. And I picked a game with a rain out. So that one doesn't exist, and the rest of them do, and there you go. There's, there's everything being calculated. So again, this is all in the code in the repository. So to summarize, going parallel is easy. Using complete, completable futures is easy. Getting benefit out of it is where, the, where your time will actually be spent. Parallel streams delegate to the common fork joint pool, but you could change the size of that pool. Completable future lets you coordinate multiple ones. And there are many, many methods available to do the, the coordination. Uh, I'll hang out if you have any questions. But otherwise, thank you very much for coming. <laughs>